Chapter Ten of Two Poets by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Ten. While Lucien was hastening to the torture in Madame de Bargeton's rooms, his sister had changed her dress for a gown of pink cambric covered with narrow stripes, a straw hat, and a little silk shawl the simple costume seemed like a rich toilette on eve for she was one of those women whose great nature lends stateliness to the least personal detail and david felt prodigiously shy of her now that she had changed her working dress he had made up his mind that he would speak of himself but now as he gave his arm to this beautiful girl and they walked through l'houmeau together he could find nothing to say to her love delights in such reverent awe as redeemed souls know on beholding the glory of god so in silence the two lovers went across the bridge of st anne and followed the left bank of the charente eve felt embarrassed by the pause and stopped to look along the river a joyous shaft of sunset had turned the water between the bridge and the new powder mills into a sheet of gold what a beautiful evening it is she said for the sake of saying something the air is warm and fresh and full of the scent of flowers and there is a wonderful sky everything speaks to our heart said david trying to proceed to love by way of analogy those who love find infinite delight in discovering the poetry of their own inmost souls in every chance effect of the landscape in the thin clear air in the scent of the earth nature speaks for them and loosens their tongues too eve said merrily you were very silent as we came through l'houmeau do you know i felt quite uncomfortable you looked so beautiful that i could not say anything david answered candidly then just now i am not so beautiful inquired she it is not that he said but i was so happy to have this walk alone with you that he stopped short in confusion and looked at the hillside and the road to scent if the walk is any pleasure to you i am delighted for i owe you an evening i think when you have given up yours for me when you refused to go to madame de bargeton's you were quite as generous as lucien when he made the demand at the risk of vexing her no not generous only wise said david and now that we are quite alone under the sky with no listeners except the bushes and the reeds by the edge of the charente let me tell you about my anxiety as to lucien's present step dear eve after all that i have just said i hope that you will look on my fears as a refinement of friendship you and your mother have done all that you could to put him above his social position but when you stimulated his ambition did you not unthinkingly condemn him to a hard struggle how can he maintain himself in the society to which his tastes incline him i know lucien he likes to reap he does not like toil it is his nature social claims will take up the whole of his time and for a man who has nothing but his brains time is capital he likes to shine society will stimulate his desires until no money will satisfy them instead of earning money he will spend it you have accustomed him to believe in his great powers in fact but the world at large declines to believe in any man's superior intellect until he has achieved some signal success now success in literature is only won in solitude and by dogged work what will madame de bargeton give your brother in return for so many days spent at her feet lucien has too much spirit to accept help from her and he cannot afford as we know to cultivate her society twice ruinous as it is for him sooner or later that woman will throw over this dear brother of ours but not before she has spoiled him for hard work and given him a taste for luxury and a contempt for our humdrum life she will develop his love of enjoyment his inclination for idleness that debauches a poetic soul 
yes it makes me tremble to think that this great lady may make a plaything of lucien if she cares for him sincerely he will forget everything else for her or if she does not love him she will make him unhappy for he is wild about her you have sent a chill of dread through my heart said eve stopping as they reached the weir but so long as mother is strong enough for her tiring life so long as i live we shall earn enough perhaps between us to keep lucien until success comes my courage will never fail said eve brightening there is no hardship in work when we work for one we love it is not drudgery it makes me happy to think that i toil so much if indeed it is toil for him oh do not be in the least afraid we will earn money enough to send lucien into the great world there lies his road to success and there lies his road to ruin returned david dear eve listen to me a man needs an independent fortune or the sublime cynicism of poverty for the slow execution of great work believe me lucien's horror of privation is so great the savor of banquets the incense of success is so sweet in his nostrils his self-love has grown so much in madame de bargeton's boudoir that he will do anything desperate sooner than fall back and you will never earn enough for his requirements then you are only a false friend to him eve cried in despair or you would not discourage us in this way eve eve cried david if only i could be a brother to lucien you alone can give me that title he would accept anything from me then i should claim the right of devoting my life to him with the love that hallows your self-sacrifice but with some worldly wisdom too eve my darling give lucien a store from which he need not blush to draw his brother's purse will be like his own will it not if you only knew all my thoughts about lucien's position if he means to go to madame de bargeton's he must not be my foreman any longer poor fellow he ought not to live in l'houmeau you ought not to be a working girl and your mother must give up her employment as well if you would consent to be my wife the difficulties will all be smoothed away lucien might live on the second floor in the place de murier until i can build rooms for him over the shed at the back of the yard if my father will allow it that is and in that way we would arrange a free and independent life for him the wish to support lucien will give me a better will to work than i ever should have had for myself alone but it rests with you to give me the right to devote myself to him some day perhaps he will go to paris the only place that can bring out all that is in him and where his talents will be appreciated and rewarded living in paris is expensive and the earnings of all three of us will be needed for his support and besides will not you and your mother need some one to lean upon then dear eve marry me for love of lucien perhaps afterwards you will love me when you see how i shall strive to help him and to make you happy we are both of us equally simple in our tastes we have few wants lucien's welfare shall be the great object of our lives his heart shall be our treasure-house we will lay up all our fortune and think and feel and hope in him worldly considerations keep us apart said eve moved by this love that tried to explain away its greatness you are rich and i am poor one must love indeed to overcome such a difficulty then you do not care enough for me cried the stricken david but perhaps your father would object never mind said david if asking my father is all that is necessary you will be my wife eve my dear eve how you have lightened life for me in a moment and my heart has been very heavy with thoughts that i could not utter i did not know how to speak of them only tell me that you care for me a little and i will take courage to tell you the rest indeed she said you make me quite ashamed but confidence for confidence i will tell you this 
that i have never thought of any one but you in my life i looked upon you as one of those men to whom a woman might be proud to belong and i did not dare to hope so great a thing for myself a penniless working girl with no prospects that is enough that is enough he answered sitting down on the bar by the weir for they had gone to and fro like mad creatures over the same length of pathway what is the matter she asked her voice expressing for the first time a woman's sweet anxiety for one who belongs to her nothing but good he answered it is the sight of a whole lifetime of happiness that dazzles me as it were it is overwhelming why am i happier than you he asked with a touch of sadness for i know that i am happier eve looked at david with mischievous doubtful eyes that asked an explanation dear eve i am taking more than i give so i shall always love you more than you love me because i have more reason to love you are an angel i am a man i am not so learned eve said smiling i love you as much as you love lucien he broke in enough to be your wife enough to devote myself to you to try not to add anything to your burdens for we shall have some struggles it will not be quite easy at first dear eve have you known that i loved you since the first day i saw you where is the woman who does not feel that she is loved now let me get rid of your scruples as to my imaginary riches i am a poor man dear yes it pleased my father to ruin me he made a speculation of me as a good many so-called benefactors do if i make a fortune it will be entirely through you that is not a lover's speech but sober serious earnest i ought to tell you about my faults for they are exceedingly bad ones in a man who has his way to make my character and habits and favorite occupations all unfit me for business and money-getting and yet we can only make money by some kind of industry if i have some faculty for the discovery of gold mines i am singularly ill adapted for getting the gold out of them but you who for your brother's sake went into the smallest details with a talent for thrift and the patient watchfulness of the born man of business you will reap the harvest that i shall sow the present state of things for i have been like one of the family for a long time weighs so heavily upon me that i have spent days and nights in search of some way of making a fortune i know something of chemistry and a knowledge of commercial requirements has put me on the scent of a discovery that is likely to pay i can say nothing as yet about it there will be a long while to wait perhaps for some years we may have a hard time of it but i shall find out how to make a commercial article at last others are busy making the same researches and if i am first in the field we shall have a large fortune i have said nothing to lucien his enthusiastic nature would spoil everything he would convert my hopes into realities and begin to live like a lord and perhaps get into debt so keep my secret for me your sweet and dear companionship will be consolation in itself during the long time of experiment and the desire to gain wealth for you and lucien will give me persistence and tenacity i had guessed this too eve said interrupting him i knew that you were one of those inventors like my poor father who must have a woman to take care of them then you love me ah say so without fear to me who saw a symbol of my love for you in your name eve was the one woman in the world if it was true in the outward world for adam it is true again in the inner world of my heart for me my god do you love me yes said she lengthening out the word as if to make it cover the extent of feeling expressed by a single syllable well let us sit here he said and taking eve's hand he went to a great bulk of timber lying below the wheels of a paper mill let me breathe the evening air and hear the frogs croak and watch the moonlight quivering upon the river 
let me take all this world about us into my soul for it seems to me that my happiness is written large over it all i am seeing it for the first time in all its splendor lighted up by love grown fair through you eve dearest this is the first moment of pure and unmixed joy that fate has given to me i do not think that lucien can be as happy as i am david felt eve's hand damp and quivering in his own and a tear fell upon it may i not know the secret she pleaded coaxingly you have a right to know it for your father was interested in the matter and to-day it is a pressing question and for this reason since the downfall of the empire calico has come more and more into use because it is so much cheaper than linen at the present moment paper is made of a mixture of hemp and linen rags but the raw material is dear and the expense naturally retards the great advance which the french press is bound to make now you cannot increase the output of linen rags a given population gives a pretty constant result and it only increases with the birth rate to make any perceptible difference in the population for this purpose it would take a quarter of a century and a great revolution in habits of life trade and agriculture and if the supply of linen rags is not enough to meet one-half nor one-third of the demand some cheaper material than linen rags must be found for cheap paper this deduction is based on facts that came under my knowledge here the angoulême papermakers the last to use pure linen rags say that the proportion of cotton in the pulp has increased to a frightful extent of late years in answer to a question from eve who did not know what pulp meant david gave an account of paper-making which will not be out of place in a volume which owes its existence in book form to the paper industry no less than to the printing press but the long digression doubtless had best be condensed at first paper an invention not less marvellous than the other dependent invention of printing was known in ancient times in china thence by the unrecognized channels of commerce the art reached asia minor where paper was made of cotton reduced to pulp and boiled parchment had become so extremely dear that a cheap substitute was discovered in an imitation of the cotton paper known in the east as charta bombicina the imitation made from rags was first made at basel in 1170 by a colony of greek refugees according to some authorities or at padua in 1301 by an italian named pax according to others in these ways the manufacture of paper was perfected slowly and in obscurity but this much is certain that so early as the reign of charles the sixth paper pulp for playing cards was made in paris when those immortals faust coster and gutenberg invented the book craftsmen as obscure as many a great artist of those times appropriated paper to the uses of typography in the fifteenth century that naive and vigorous age names were given to the various formats as well as to the different sizes of type names that bear the impress of the naivete of the times and the various sheets came to be known by the different watermarks on their centres the grapes the figure of our saviour the crown the shield or the flower-pot just as at a later day the eagle of napoleon's time gave the name to the double eagle size and in the same way the types were called cicero st augustine and canon type because they were first used to print the treatises of cicero and theological and liturgical works italics are so called because they were invented in italy by aldus of venice before the invention of machine-made paper which can be woven in any length the largest sized sheets were the grand jesus and the double columbier this last being scarcely used now except for atlases or engravings and the size of paper for printer's use was determined by the dimensions of the impression stone when david explained these things to eve web paper was almost undreamed of in france although about seventeen ninety nine 
denis robert de sun had invented a machine for turning out a ribbon of paper and didot saint léger had since tried to perfect it the vellum paper invented by amboise didot only dates back as far as seventeen eighty this bird's eye of the history of the invention shows incontestably that great industrial and intellectual advances are made exceedingly slowly and little by little even as nature herself proceeds perhaps articulate speech and the art of writing were gradually developed in the same groping way as typography and paper-making rag-pickers collect all the rags and old linen of europe the printer concluded and buy any kind of tissue the rags are sorted and warehoused by the wholesale rag merchants who supply the paper mills to give you some idea of the extent of the trade you must know mademoiselle that in eighteen fourteen cardon the banker owner of the pulping troughs of bruges and Langley, where leaurier de lille endeavored in seventeen seventy six to solve the very problem that occupied your father cardon brought an action against one proust for an error in weights of two millions in a total of ten million pounds weight of rags worth about four million francs the manufacturer washes the rags and reduces them to a thin pulp which is strained exactly as a cook strains sauce through a tammy through an iron frame with a fine wire bottom where the mark which gives its name to the size of the paper is woven the size of this mould as it is called regulates the size of the sheet when i was with the messieurs didot david continued they were very much interested in this question and they are still interested for the improvement which your father endeavoured to make is a great commercial requirement and one of the crying needs of the time and for this reason although linen lasts so much longer than cotton that it is in reality cheaper in the end the poor would rather make the smaller outlay in the first instance and by virtue of the law of y victus pay enormously more before they have done the middle classes do the same so there is a scarcity of linen in england where four-fifths of the population use cotton to the exclusion of linen they make nothing but cotton paper the cotton paper is very soft and easily creased to begin with and it has a further defect it is so soluble that if you seep a book made of cotton paper in water for fifteen minutes it turns to a pulp while an old book left in water for a couple of hours is not spoilt you could dry the old book and the pages though yellow and faded would still be legible the work would not be destroyed there is a time coming when legislation will equalize our fortunes and we shall all be poor together we shall want our linen and our books to be cheap just as people are beginning to prefer small pictures because they have not wall space enough for large ones well the shirts and the books will not last that is all it is the same on all sides solidity is drying out so this problem is one of the first importance for literature science and politics one day in my office there was a hot discussion going on about the material that the chinese use for making paper their paper is far better than ours because the raw material is better and a good deal was said about this thin light chinese paper for if it is thin and light the texture is close there are no transparent spots in it in paris there are learned men among the printer's readers fourier and pierre leroux are la chevardiere's readers at this moment and the comte de saint-simon who happened to be correcting proofs for us came in in the middle of the discussion he told us at once that according to kempfer and du halde the brusanitia furnishes the substance of the chinese paper it is a vegetable substance like linen or cotton for that matter another reader maintained that chinese paper was principally made of an animal substance to wit the silk that is abundant there they made a bet about it in my presence the messieurs didot are printers to the institute so naturally they referred the question to that learned body monsieur marcel who used to be superintendent of the royal printing establishment was umpire and he sent the two readers to monsieur l'abbe grosier librarian at the arsenal 
by the abbe's decision they both lost their wages the paper was not made of silk nor yet from the brusanitia the pulp proved to be the triturated fibre of some kind of bamboo the abbe grosier had a chinese book an iconographical and technological work with a great many pictures in it illustrating all the different processes of paper-making and he showed us a picture of the workshop with the bamboo stalks lying in a heap in the corner it was extremely well drawn lucien told me that your father with the intuition of a man of talent had a glimmering of a notion of some way of replacing linen rags with an exceedingly common vegetable product not previously manufactured but taken direct from the soil as the chinese use vegetable fibre at first hand i have classified the guesses made by those who came before me and have begun to study the question the bamboo is a kind of reed naturally i began to think of the reeds that grow here in france labor is very cheap in china where a workman earns three halfpence a day and this cheapness of labor enables the chinese to manipulate each sheet of paper separately they take it out of the mold and press it between heated tablets of white porcelain that is the secret of the surface and consistence the lightness and satin smoothness of the best paper in the world well here in europe the work must be done by machinery machinery must take the place of cheap chinese labor if we could but succeed in making a cheap paper of as good a quality the weight and thickness of printed books would be reduced by more than one half a set of voltaire printed on our woven paper and bound weighs about two hundred and fifty pounds it would only weigh fifty if we used chinese paper that surely would be a triumph for the housing of many books has come to be a difficulty everything has grown smaller of late this is not an age of giants men have shrunk everything about them shrinks and house room into the bargain great mansions and great suites of rooms will be abolished sooner or later in paris for no one will afford to live in the great houses built by our forefathers what a disgrace for our age if none of its books should last dutch paper that is paper made from flax will be quite unobtainable in ten years time well your brother told me of this idea of your father's this plan for using vegetable fibre in paper-making so you see that if i succeed you have a right to lucien came up at that moment and interrupted david's generous assertion i do not know whether you have found the evening pleasant said he it has been a cruel time for me poor lucien what can have happened cried eve as she saw her brother's excited face the poet told the history of his agony pouring out a flood of clamorous thoughts into those friendly hearts eve and david listening in pained silence to a torrent of woes that exhibited such greatness and such pettiness monsieur de bargeton is an old dotard the indigestion will carry him off before long no doubt lucien said as he made an end and then i will look down on these proud people i will marry madame de bargeton i read to-night in her eyes a love as great as mine for her yes she felt all that i felt she comforted me she is as great and noble as she is gracious and beautiful she will never give me up it is time that life was made smooth for him is it not murmured david and for answer eve pressed his arm without speaking david guessed her thoughts and began at once to tell lucien about his own plans if lucien was full of his troubles the lovers were quite as full of themselves so absorbed were they so eager that lucien should approve their happiness that neither eve nor david so much as noticed his start of surprise at the news madame de bargeton's lover had been dreaming of a great match for his sister he would reach a high position first and then secure himself by an alliance with some family of influence and here was one more obstacle in his way to success his hopes were dashed to the ground 
if madame de bargeton consents to be madame de rubempre she would never care to have david sechard for a brother-in-law this stated clearly and precisely was the thought that tortured lucien's inmost mind louise is right he thought bitterly a man with a career before him is never understood by his family End of chapter 10